Hello, everyone. Sean and I would like to officially welcome you to our regulatory compliance hot topics discussion. We've prepared a lot of informative information that we can't wait to share with you. We hope that you also have a little bit of fun with us today. Sean and I were teasing right before the program started that we are one of the rare people that actually find compliance fun most of the time. So most with that, I'm going to, right, most of the time, <laughs> I'm going to let Sean explain and provide a little bit of a background, and then I will talk about me as well. Go ahead, Sean. All right. Uh, just to go over my bio real quickly. Uh, my name is Sean Harms. I'm the principal of our uh, regulatory compliance and, and BSA function in our consulting practice. I'm actually housed in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, where you can see it's nice and sunny today, which is great. It's actually decent weather, which is uh, not really that way in the South, usually. Uh, I've been doing this for over 20 years, so either I'm glutton for punishment or dumb. I haven't decided which one yet. Uh, but I love compliance, and, and uh, hopefully we're going to share some really good things that we've uh, heard from regulators and seen some exams and some audits. All right. Thank you, Jean. And I am Kylie Durbin. I'm a lead consultant in our Louisville office. I started as a teller a long time ago and have done a little bit of everything in the bank, spending my last 10 years focused on rebuilding and tearing down deficient compliance programs and rebuilding them into strong proactive compliance programs. So Sean and I are really excited to talk through all of our discussion topics today. So now that you know a little bit about us, we would like to get to know you a little better. So with our first polling question, we want to know who your primary regulator is. So we've got a couple of options on the screen, CFPB, FDIC, the Federal Reserve, the NCUA, or the OCC, or maybe something else. So go ahead and spend some time filling out that so we can get to know you better. And then, John, what are you seeing in the differences to the examination approach or anything you want to share as it relates to our regulators? Well, one of the reasons why we asked this question to start with is because there are such, uh, there are some similarities, but there are some differences within the regulatory agencies. And so when you really get a gauge of what your primary regulator, regulator is and, and how you know, what, what you're looking at, we can kind of define more on some of the hot topics. Of course, we're going to touch on all of them uh, today. But when you look at some of the regulators, they have their hot button issues and they, that's what they stick with. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're addressing some of those issues as, as we go through some of these areas. Perfect. So it's very helpful for us to know that, of course. Right. We've got a really all good right. mix. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Some large, some FDIC, FRB, good. All right, that gives us some good information, so we're ready to go. All right, thank you for participating. So we are officially, I'm not trying to get into a political discussion, but it is important to note that we are about 12 days out from the next presidential election. And as compliance and risk professional professionals, the elections do have potential to impact what our future regulatory environment looks like. We look back at some of the policies of our democratic leaders, we see that they have a history of increasing those consumer protections, expanding regulations when possible. Whereas we may see a slight adjustment when we get into that Republican leader. They may be in favor of lessening some of those regulatory requirements. But something to keep in mind is regardless of what those results end up being in November, there is always going to be a need for some type of compliance regulatory oversight. We can't get away from that. So our first topic of discussion is going to focus on what our regulatory environment looks like. So our examination approach, and as Sean brought up, why we are asking about who your primary regulator is, is a lot of this shift in focus that we see in our examination process depends on the regulatory environment and who your regulator is. I can give some experience as a former chief compliance officer and a director of audit and compliance before I joined Forvis Mazars. I would get a lot of information. I signed up to be proactive for supervisory highlights. I read the enforcement actions, but 
after a while, it starts to become so overwhelming, trying to keep up with all the different information that's out there, the guidance from opinions, the different regulators, who is focusing on what, and it sometimes felt like the target was moving all the time. You never knew what you were supposed to focus in on now. So you may also have experienced that, no, in my past I have, it felt like you are kept asked to do more and more and more with less and less resources. So that leads me to my first question where I'm interested to get Sean's take on his experiences and what he's seeing and why this program will hopefully be helpful to you. What do we need to focus in on in our regulatory environment? So our first question is what regulatory supervisory trends are you seeing in your audit work or with your discussions with other organizations? Uh, you can get into a lot of stuff with this question. Uh, this, is, this is a pretty detailed question. Uh, I will tell you from uh, what you just said, it's, it's a very valid point. I hear all the time, actually, I just was, at a, I was talking to a CEO the other day, and his comment was, uh, they keep moving the goalpost on us. Uh, the regulations have, are, have not changed, but they keep having different expectations. And yes, that, that is true. I mean, that that's just what they're going to go for and, and, and their hot topics that they're going to hit on. You know, you look at uh, the Federal Reserve, they're gonna concentrate on redlining. You look at uh, the, the FDIC, what did they cost? Overdrafts, representments, things like that. And we're gonna talk about some of these in more detail as we go through, but you know, really we got out of a, a rule of enforcing actions, or excuse me, not enforcing actions, making rules in the regular guidelines that we've had. So, you know, you usually go through a, a proposal period, then you go through a, a comment period, and then you go through the final period in your implementation, now we're getting to the instances to where we're being regulated over social media. Uh, politicians are just going out there and putting things out on social media, such as what we call junk fees. And we go through some of that and it's not defined in Reg DD, it's not defined in Reg Z. And so we're having trouble as a compliance officer really staying in front of some of that stuff and trying to keep ahead of not only what we have to deal with in the regulatory space, but also what's coming at us from a social media or a public influence side of it, because we're getting kind of hit on it both ways. And when you look at some of this stuff from a trend standpoint, you know, we do have the CFPB's constitutional now. That's finalized. Some of these lawsuits are being settled, and we're going to talk about 1071 later on. But when you see some of this stuff, there's some unknowns that are out there with the Chevron ruling being uh, taken back and some of the guidance that was issued under there. And so you know, when you go through some of these trends, the regulators are really short staffed and they're trying to figure out some of the stuff the same way you are and they're having the same challenges you are. And so that's a lot of the trends that we're seeing is is they're wanting you to do more with less. And, and we're going to concentrate on CMS a little bit later and get into that. But it's an interesting trend. And and also one more thing I'll add on that is usually, like Holly said, you usually see between the administrations the differences. Well, right now, We've got Democrat administration, which is important on compliance level, but we also have two wars going on. So BSA is important and you see the scrutiny that's going to go on there. And so, you know, really you, you have to look at it from the focus of consumer harm, your compliance management system and things like that. So, so important. So on that same process, what recommendations can you offer or what support can we find for audit compliance and risk professionals as we keep seeing this evolving and increasing regulatory environment and those challenges? Again, super question. And I think that you you answered a lot of that to start with. You know, use the resources that are out there for free. Sign up for the supervisory insights. Look at some of this stuff. Uh, there's two things I'll bring up on this topic. Number one, we're a call center. We've got to do more with less. And you know that, that's just what we have to deal with these days. And that's just part of our life as risk managers. You know, our, our job is to protect the bank from additional risk. We're not always the well-liked person. Uh, we're not always, you know, we walk in the office and they, what the hell are you doing here kind of type of thing. You know, you want to, you want to make sure that we're there for support. I'll tell you two things. Number one, you can't ever be the no person. 
So when you're talking about compliance, the importance of communication within your organization is essential, especially when you talk about change management, as we're going through some of these changes with CRA, 1071, other things that are being put out there. If you don't communicate and you don't really support management and figure out a way to do it, they might not like the way you want to do it, but if we don't have a situation to where we can provide guidance and options for management, we're deemed to fail. I was at a bank about $2.4 billion. Uh, they had they had a, a compliance officer and they didn't feel like they could get a good answer from this person. And so they felt like it was always no, it was always the negative, it wasn't gonna work. And then what happened? They just went around the compliance officer and then all sorts of problems got created because of the lack of control in place. And so communication and making sure that, that you go through it is so, so important. And the second part is identifying your risk. You know, I remember when risk assessments came out and we first started doing them back when BSA was, was done in 2011 when the BSA manual came out and risk assessments were just kind of a fill in the box kind of, kind of thing. But the importance of a risk assessment now to identify those key factors and look at the risk, you know, don't just do things like you always have just because you've always done it that way. With the limits that we have on our resources and the limits that we have on some of the people that we have, we may not everybody wants to do compliance and so we may need to look at adjusting our programs looking at different things from a risk perspective don't want to say cutting things not what i mean but adjusting things to more of your risk environment and those are things that could really put you on the the limelight for success so I have to say, I will promise not to get on many soapboxes, but you did say my favorite trigger word when you said that we are a cost center. I have lived my life in compliance that we are profit retention centers. Yes, we are not revenue generating, but we are helping you keep all of those revenues. So we are a profit retention center. So you need that. And what I would say, though, it goes right back to it. That communication so that individuals see your value is so important. So if you take one thing away from me, just know that that is my hot button issue is we are a profit retention center. All right. Good point. So as we look at our consumer compliance program, I think that was a great segue into our next section. We look at our consumer compliance programs and they're built on a commitment for our organization to not only maintain compliance with rules and regulations, but we're also built on that commitment to our customers and our communities, we are trying to establish things with fairness and equality and that great customer experience. It's often ingrained in our financial institution process. We are a valuable resource to our community. So with that, we are starting to see this increased focus and, and expectation of fair banking. And in our, our slides, we know we talk about these four primary lending laws that are the fair lending statutes. They're put in place to prohibit discrimination on one of those prohibited bases. There's a collection and data collection requirement. All of our lending processes, if you have lending functions, are going to be impacted by one or more of these rules and regulations. And we do have to focus on this fairness and consumer protection. As we look at some of the regulations that are coming out, the new rules under CRA, we have the expansion as we'll talk about in our next few slides of 1071 with additional data requirements. This is going to be such a massive work effort for our organizations when this goes into play. So we've got a couple of questions for you, Sean, to add to, and again, these resources are here for you as we work through our process. But when we talk about fair banking in that regulatory space, how are you seeing this play out during audits and examinations specifically in fair lending, 1071, CRA, as, and as you mentioned a little bit, we're gonna talk about overdrafts for sure. I, I will tell you that we could spend two hours talking about these topics right here. And uh, that's not Absolutely. what we're intending to do, but you know, there, there's so much out there that we could talk about. So what I wanted to do was kind of talk about high level on a few things uh, on, on the side of it. Number one is fair lending. Uh, you know, I, I tell banks all the time, 
a couple of different things. Number one, if you try to get your fair lending risk eliminated, you're going to be pulling all your hair out and, you know, you may want to jump off the top of the bank or credit union or company, whatever you're dealing with. Uh, and, and when you look at that, our our goal is not to eliminate our fair lending, lending, lending risk, it's to manage our fair lending risk and get it to a point to where we know that we don't have a discriminatory factor or we limit the fact of that discrimination. The issue that you come into is that a lot of banks are hit, getting hit with despair treatment now. And not only the fact of redlining as well, but despair treatment is, is really what you've got to focus on. And I don't care if you're $40 million or $100 billion, it doesn't matter. Fair lending applies to you and, and regardless in some way. I was just on a phone call with the FDIC today talking about uh, fair lending and they were grueling the bank over their underwriting and, and pricing practices because they're doing uh, a, a review of race on installment loans and we don't even collect that information. And so we're using a lot more data. The data has, has really overtaken fair lending, it, you know, whether it be your Humdalar, whether it be, you know, your consumer installment loans, the data is so important. And they're using that to where they're making assumptions about you before they even walk into your bank. And so when you look at that, you've got to understand that. The biggest thing with the fair lending side of it, and I'll tell you the best advice I can I, I can give you, is most banks that have a fair lending program or most institutions that have a fair lending uh, problem is due to a lack of procedure and control. When those procedures and controls are not being followed, you can probably guarantee that you're going to have something out there. And remember, in the Obama administration, they came out and said, look, unintentional discrimination is intentional discrimination. So the fact of, oh, I didn't mean it, I didn't hear about it, we didn't talk about it, I don't know anything about it, is not an excuse. And so we need to know what our data says. We need to understand what we go through. And remember this too, when the exception becomes a normal practice, you have a problem. So you can say, look at all these procedures I've got. We've got this nice little pricing sheet. we got all this stuff in place. And you go, you have a 50% exception rate. And you go, oh, I didn't know that. That means that it's not working. Once you're getting about 15, 20% exceptions, and that's not, that's a Sean rule. That is not anything that's in the regulatory side of it. They're going to start asking questions. So make sure your, your procedures match what you're doing in the bank. And, af and absolutely, I just to add to that too, is the worst thing that you can have happen is someone else tell a story for you. So yes. with that data collection, you need to know and look at your data every possible way because you want to be able to tell the story when your regulators come in, not have them have a story for you or you trying to chase your tail figuring out does their story actually match. So make sure that you're being proactive. You know, you brought up data collection and I think that that is such an important part. And I think that segues nicely into 1071. <laughs> what do you want to talk no about with 1071? There's going to be so much data already on top of what we collect in the, the world and in an area where we've normally not had a lot of requirements for compliance. So what's your take on 1071? Well, I, my first take on it is watch your back. And I say that uh, it, it facetiously and honestly, because this is going to be a whole new world for these commercial lenders. You think about what we have to go through from collecting Humda data and how difficult it is to get application date from commercial lenders or get them to report something for CRA community development, you know, or even them think flood is associated with them. I mean, you can go on and on and on about some of the stuff. I mean, this rule is going to be targeted directly towards you know, commercial lending. So there's two things I really want to talk about since we're talking about hot, hot topics and things that, that I'm concerned about. So number one, you really need to start planning. For your tier one filers, I really hope that you got some stuff in place. Tier two, tier three, we're gonna learn for some lessons, unfortunately, from the tier one filers. We're going to learn that. Uh, but make sure you've got the policies, make sure you got your controls in place, make sure you go through everything, make sure your stakeholders are involved. If you don't talk to your commercial lenders and don't get their input and work on it, you're deemed to fail. If you just put something in place and don't get their opinions, it's not going to work. And so we can't just rush and throw something together or call a third party and say, hey, Sean, I need a 1071 program. It's not going to work that way. We're going to have to make sure that we're looking at from our side, our bank, and what we're doing. And it's going to be a dramatic change for all that. The second, two th the, the second thing and to combine things that we'll talk about is the firewall. How are we going to deal with the firewall? What are we going to do there? Uh, you know, the CFPB 
kind of didn't give us a lot of information. They kind of gave us a small bank exclusion, but essentially there's not much there. I'll tell you what I compare it to. For those of you all who remember when the USA Patriot Act came out. So October 1st of 2003, what did we have? We had CIP come out. When CIP came out, what did we do? We had to get this driver's license for all these different people. So we just threw it in those loan files. Well, what did the examiners came in? Nope, that's a violation of Reg B. You can't have the ID in there with the, with that thing and or with the loan file. And so we had to back up and say, wait, wait we got to get a new process. We got to get those IDs in somewhere else. Think about that as you're going through the 1071 process. How is that going to work? The next thing and probably the most concerning thing to me is the CFPB put some information in there that seems to be helpful to us, but it's not going to be helpful to us. There is an out from 1071 that essentially says that if the customer doesn't complete the data, we don't have to get it based on visual observation or anything like that, like we would ECOA, fair lending, Honda rules, things like that. So what happens when your bank has 80% of your customers that don't complete that? That's gonna tell me you have a broken process, but you have to think about stuff like that. So what you need to look at is maybe by loan officer, maybe by branch, who's not doing it, who's not going through that process and make sure you understand how that works. Also think about this way. We may see things to where they turn it into a consumer loan to try to get out of the 1071 stuff. So what's going to happen when you have commercial loan officers trying to make consumer loans and they've never made them in their life? You've got to think about some, some of the stuff like this and the, the interaction that it's going to have with some of our programs. So we did have something I wanted to just circle back under our fair lending discussion. Someone did put in the Q and A's that they just finished a fair lending examination. They had a suggestion from the examiner to take your exception list to loan committee when yep. second review is performed on pending denials. That's correct. So what they're looking for right now in fair lending is they're trying to see what group of class of individuals are affected. So, we can get, like I said, we can talk about this for days. Disparity ratios, number of days they're doing the application. How many are you denying of one group versus the other? How many exceptions are you allowing one group versus the other? If you don't have something in place to look at that or have, you know, whether it be an internal monitoring process in the second line, whether you have an internal audit or an audit firm on the third line, uh, whether you have software for it, there's a lot of different things that you can do, but again, it, it's, it comes back to what you said earlier. It, you can't just say, oh, I didn't know and not be aware of it. it you've got to understand what impacts your lending uh, platform or your lending program is dealing with on some of these control groups and some of these target groups, because we need to know if we're denying African-Americans at a, a rate of three times more than we're doing whites. That could be a problem. Does that mean it's a problem? No, it just means we have a risk that we have to look into. And so knowing your data and knowing what to do with it is so important because you don't want those examiners coming in and telling you something you go, oh God, I had no idea. And right. so we've got to make sure to understand that. So that's an excellent point. And yes, we could get all up into that. Uh, but yes, that, that is something that's the expectation right now. And I can tell you, I heard that from the FDIC today uh, and, and talking about it. So we did get another one, and I think it's still like it's relevant with our 1071. Can you provide an explanation on the firewall, please? Oh, Lord. So essentially what the 1071 firewall is, is it's trying to put into place procedures or a law, well, not really a law, it's part of the law, to balance who collects the information. So essentially what they're saying is we want this information to uh, monitor you and to get this for every business that you deal with under $5 million, but we don't want the loan officers to use that information negatively against that information, against that person, whether they're, you know, LGBTQ, whether they're, you know, African American, whether they're Hispanic, whether they're female, whatever it may be, we don't want to use that against them. So we have to have something in the firewall capability to where there's a separation between those who are making the decision and the information that we know at that time to to make that decision and so it's it's very similar to what we've already had in place how we collect monitoring information for Honda loans but we can't use that information in our decision it's the same thing but there's specific rules out there for the firewall on 1071 of how you have to put 
things in place. And so you've got to do it what fits best for your institution and you have to do it what fits best for your process. Don't just change a whole bunch of processes for it. Have something in place to where we can show that we're not using this information in a negative way. Perfect. We we did talk about it a little bit earlier. You, you'd you mentioned about overdrafts. I think sometimes oh, people yeah. forget that that is in that lending space. We've seen a lot of items coming out over the last few years and seeing it in our examination trends as well, where your teams are coming in and they're asking about your overdraft practices. What do you think is important for individuals to take back with their organization today? So I'll tell you from the overdraft perspective, we like, again, we I've spent hours talking to banks about overdrafts and, and overdraft sessions and, and talked about this. Let me just boil it down to a couple of different points real quickly. Most banks that are having trouble in overdrafts right now are due to system issues. They're not looking at their system and making sure that their system is doing what their disclosure says or that they have had an update for representments that has come through their core and they haven't uploaded it yet or they have the authorized positive set on negative and they haven't updated that. It doesn't mean you have to have live processing, but there's ways that you can do that within your system. And I've seen banks that just forgotten to check a box and it leads into a year investigation with the Federal Reserve or the FDIC. I've seen representments that we've had to go back and issue thousands of dollars of, of money back. Uh, we've seen instances to, to where the disclosures were not anywhere close to what the actual system shows. But I'll wrap up on that because, again, we could talk about this forever and overdrafts is something I talked about before. Don't panic and say, oh, we just got to get rid of overdrafts. There is an overdraft rule out there. It is banks over $10 billion or institutions over $10 billion from the CFPB that's in proposed status. That's To say it's not going to affect all of us, we're joking. We're kidding ourselves. It's going to affect all of us from a competition perspective, all that stuff. You see all the commercials right now, no overdrafts and, you know, guys sleeping in the on the couch talking about no overdrafts and things like that yeah okay but we also have to realize that if we have something like that and we're still charging other fees we have to be pretty sure our disclosures are accurate and describe those processes and so really look at your disclosures just because you're disclosing an unfair practice doesn't mean it's not an unfair practice but make sure your disclosures are accurate your systems work in the way that it should and you go through all your updates that's the biggest thing that will help you from the overdraft perspective right now. Perfect. Thanks. You know, in the fair banking sense, it does make sense that we often talk about it in that lending space, but it is starting to, we can see with overdrafts because they do have a deposit component. It is starting to blend out and, and you alluded to it earlier with the junk fees as well. This mm -hmm. environment where we're looking at and expecting fairness in all of our dealings. So are you anticipating or do you have an opinion on how this is going to impact your board and management discussions, fee structures and customer relationships? And we can tie in Regulation E and check fraud as part of that fairness part as well. Again, this is something that's just huge. Uh, when you talk about uh, check fraud specifically, um, you know, we're seeing things that when the Fed districts were combined back in 2005, 2006, the Cleveland Fed, we thought that was going to be the end of checks. And now we're seeing things that I, I, I call it, you know, like the movie Catch Me If You Can, to where he's putting planes in the bathtub and putting stickers on there. We're seeing some of the same stuff that we seen back in the 70s of washing checks, stealing checks out of mailboxes, you know, things like that that are happening that we just never thought we'd see again. One of the things you have to understand as far as the fair banking side of it is, is remember Reg CC specifically says you cannot type cast checks. So you can't just say, hey, just because it's a check from this person or, hey, just because it's a check from this company. You know, it used to be the overdraft convenience or the credit card convenience checks. We're going to put a hold on every one of them. We can't type cast check. Just don't take the check. And so when you look at some of this stuff, our ultimate goal is to be fair to all customers. That's what we're here to do. And as long as we're thinking about some of this stuff, that will be our success. When we get into the junk fees discussion, we're going to see more and more about it. I mean, there's stuff all over about it. And, you know, it's not just us. It's Ticketmaster. It's planes. It's everybody. And look, I just bought tickets. Ticketmaster charged me a lot. I'm fine with them losing some of those fees. I'm good with that. Um, but, you know, it's not just us. But you know what? If I don't pay my taxes in time, they're going to charge me a late fee. 
So why does the government get to charge us a late fee and we're not allowed to assess it? And those are questions that we can get answered. And so, again, it's the court of public opinion that's going to really uh, get this until the CFPB comes out with some guidance. And unfortunately, there's no law about it. And so does the Chevron rule and the guidance hinder the ability of the CFPB to give us something on this? I would argue yes, because right now, really, everything that comes out from the regulators, they're getting sued on. And so there's a lot of things that are on hold and, and there's a lot of things that, that are really up in the air. And, and that's unfortunate because uh, guidance is what we depend on and what we need. And without guidance, we're just hanging out there on the cliff. And uh, hopefully that changes soon. So we got a question that came in when we're talking about Reg CC. Can we have different hold standards for commercial accounts versus consumer accounts? So Reg CC covers both consumer and commercial accounts. So you would have to have the same hold standards. Now, uh, if you've got uh, some commercial check fraud that you've seen, I know we've got a lot. I talked to a bank the other day about, uh, actually Monday, about counterfeit uh, cashier's checks that are going through. And, and, you know, I know we've got one bank, not to get into a whole bunch of stories, but I can tell you stories for days. We had one bank several years ago to where the Mexican mafia came in this little bitty town and uh, ended up having a couple people work there. They got their checks, they re they duplicated to them and they lost, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars like in two days and the Secret Service was there within two hours of them calling them. And so there are a lot of things that, that go on with it. So I would say that you you I again, this is Sean's rules, not Forbes Mazars, not a regulatory thing of it. I would rather you take a slap on the hand of Red CC than lose twenty five thousand dollars. But that does not mean that we have to we have to ignore the rule. We have to use the rule to our benefit and still take care of the customer. So if we got a rule for doubtful collection and we see that the check just looks weird, it's post-dated, stale dated, whatever it may be, or it just doesn't feel right, document that, use that. You can argue seven days isn't enough. I understand, I get that, but unfortunately that's what we're stuck with. And so commercial and consumer are both gonna be subjected to Reg CC, so you need to look at that. One thing I'll add at the end, though, if it's not deposited in person, then you have certain aspects that you can deal with, and a lot of those commercial accounts are not. And so there are some things that you might be able to do that way. But in general, Reg CC is going to apply to both uh, those consumer and, and commercial accounts. All right. Thank you. So our next hot topic as we move forward is going to be RESPA. Now, I will promise not to nerd out because RESPA is one of my favorite topics, but we're gonna talk about <laughs> Section 8 specifically. And the rules surrounding Section 8 are going to prohibit kickbacks, unearned fees, and these rules have been in place, as, as, we've, as we've talked about this, for a really long time. But there seems to be this renewed interest in the regulatory space as it relates to RESPA Section 8. So it's not dead, gone, and buried. It's coming back to life as for spooky season. So watch out for RESPA. And we're in this really hyper-competitive market right now. And I think you're starting to see organizations trying to be really creative in Ooh, their outreach word. and their partnerships. They wanna be innovative and enterprising. So I think it would be helpful as we start to discuss how organizations can review and mitigate some of those potential compliance risks. And as you'll see in the next slide, Oh, I just saw a question come in. Let me answer that before we head in really quick. I've seen some banks require positive pay on commercial accounts for customers to sign in, oh. taking liability. What are your thoughts? Uh, that's going to get into a whole nother topic. Okay. It's going to be based on state <laughs> law and things like that. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we have time to answer that one. We may have okay. to take that one offline. Okay, we'll take that offline then. All right. So we do have the background of RESPA Section 8 coverage, remembering that you can't have an exchange or give a thing of value or receive a thing of value in exchange for a referral as part of that settlement service. So as part of our materials, we have provided some helpful information. And we are, we, I keep seeing some questions pop up about polling questions. There'll be one right after this. We are in our conversation and just flowing. We'll get you. All right, so as I mentioned, and I'm excited to talk to Sean through this, is the regulatory focus has really been heating up where it relates to RESPA Section 8. We've seen a lot of comments from the CFPB over the last two years. 
I thought it was interesting. The FDIC has issued and addressed concerns with RESPA Section 8 in three out of the last four supervisory highlights. So this is something that we need to be aware of and have a discussion on. So Sean, what is a best practice for organizations to implement and effectively address RESPA Section 8? Well, we talked about supervisory insights and, that, and that's very good information, but I will also say the enforcement actions as well. Um, you know, one of the things that it, it is very beneficial to us as, as compliance officers, we use the same old training over and over and over again. Like I said, this is not a new rule, but use some of these things that have come out as examples. You know, Freedom Mortgage got hit by a $1.7 million fine. And not only them, the realtor got hit by a $200,000 fine for violations of RESPA Section 8 in both events they sponsored for them, um, you know, giving away services for free and in and, uh, and exchange for referrals, having a marketing service agreement that basically was a mask for referrals. Let me just talk about this from a Section 8 perspective, and this is why I wanted to include it, or we, why we wanted to include it on our, in our discussions, is what's the environment right now? It's very fierce. It's very, you know, the mortgage markets have dried up. Interest rates are still not come down. They came down a little bit. Now they're going back up. We don't know where they're going, and it could influence by the election, a lot of different things. So a lot of these loan officers are trying to do what they did three years ago and try to keep up with the same income and same flow. It's not happening anymore. And so what we're seeing is creative. That was the great way of putting it, creative ways to do it. Let me tell you something. Just because somebody's never done it before, there may be a reason why somebody's never done it before. And I can't stand the lenders that come up and say, hey, everybody else is doing it. Why can't we? Well, let me tell you something. You don't know how they're doing. We've got people out there that have preferred lender status with a, a builder. And you're like, they can't do that. It's a violation of RESPA. Tell me why it's a violation of RESPA. If they're exchanging money, absolutely. If they're going through any kind of referral, absolutely. But if they say, hey, look, we're gonna close your loan within 25 days and we'll give you the best customer service that's out there if, if you'll just uh, you know, depend on us to be your bank and show us that you know, we can support you, that's not a violation. There's no exchange of funds, there's no exchange of money. And so what we've gotta really watch out for are some of these events and things like that and really just concentrate. Know what your lenders are doing and make sure they're educated because we don't want them to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. And if we get to the forgiveness stage, then we're probably already in trouble. Uh, you know, I, one quick example, and then we'll go on to the polling question and start talking about third parties. But one of the things that I got a call from a bank uh, not too long ago, and they said, hey, our, real, our loan officer wants to go pass out $50 gift cards to this one 20 person realtor. I'm like, no, there's very few times that I will sit there and tell a bank no. I usually try to find a solution, try to be the resource, try to help out. This one, I was like, no. And so you sometimes you have to do that, but there are some ways that you can kind of monitor that and make sure that nothing sticks out. So that's just what I want to talk about. Watch out for those relationships. Make sure you understand the agreements we're getting into. And just remember, if somebody else hasn't done it and we're trying to be innovative, there might be a reason why somebody hasn't done it. Right. Great points. So we all will head into our second polling question. I think it makes sense because we've noted that we are in this hyper competitive market and we want to maybe be a little bit more creative. So what are you or are you relying on more third parties, maybe considering partnerships with fintechs as we get into this more competitive, more innovative market? And, and, and talk about the fintechs, you know, we'll, yeah. we'll get into this, just go ahead and get started while you're answering these questions. Yeah. You know, fintechs are the, the way of the future, a lot of this stuff. Technology, you know, for example, we have some AI technology that I was looking at the other day and it was just fantastic, it was great. But how do you use that? What do you look at for your customer data? How do you, how do you depend on that? Those are questions you gotta ask for, you just jump right into it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So once we get the answer to that, we'll jump right into it. How about that? Well, and that's what it makes perfect sense that we're having these conversations because you cannot talk compliance without talking third party risk management, third party oversight. Yeah. It remains a priority for our regulators. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get into our compliance management. Okay. okay so we've got good a good enough. mix, a yeah. good split. But I this mean, is going I mean, to be how, a requirement. How yeah. else does it happen? We're usually the last people that know. Hey, we're going to roll right. out this product. That's great. When's it going to roll out? Tomorrow. Oh, 
super. Right. I mean, you know, we got to stay ahead of some of that stuff. Absolutely. And so that's how we have to incorporate this into our strong compliance management programs, which we will get into. But when we talk about third party oversight, this has been the year of guidance. I feel like new guidance is coming out every five seconds. And there was some information that came out in May of this year where the regulators provided this interagency guide for community banks to help you be able to develop risk management processes and internal controls. And so as we saw, there is some increased interest on organizations to rely on third parties, maybe have some of those fintech partnerships. So in order for us to make sure that we're effectively managing it, we need to make sure that we're looking at our programs. So as we see banks relying on vendors and third party service providers, what are some of the key expectations that you're seeing from regulators regarding vendor management and third party oversight? Well, that poll was very helpful to kind of see that we have a mix of yes and no. So that, so that is good. Um, so really when you're looking at the third party side of it, you know, the best thing I can tell you is stay in front of it. You know, make sure that you have a seat at the table, make sure, and it doesn't have to be to start with, but it needs to be within the process. Saying, hey, we're launching this tomorrow is not good. But when you look at some of this stuff from a third party side of it, we have to look at how are they dealing with the customer? What data are they bringing in? How is the account going to be set up? What controls do we have in place? Because ultimately, you're responsible for that third party. And if they're money laundering through you, you're the one that's responsible. And so we have to make sure that we have things in place for the compliance side of it. I'm working on a bank right now. It's got over 40 fintechs. We're looking at every single one of their disclosures. So every product this fintech has, we're looking to make sure they're they're doing their Reg E disclosures, their truth and savings disclosure, their statements are correct, all their processes. You're responsible for some of that stuff to make sure those are working and the processes are going through. So you've got to make sure that they're monitoring that because you have to make sure that the control is in place or the regulators are going to come down on you. Perfect. I think that kind of answered question seven as well of yeah. what are we doing to be able to manage risk. Oh, so um, I want to see, I think we had some questions come in, but we can address them at the end. We'll just keep going with where okay. we're at because I think this makes sense when you start to talk about our compliance management programs and yep. Our conversations today, I think, have helped to demonstrate the value of a proactive compliance program as one of those profit retention centers. So heading into our third polling question, we want to ask how or does, yeah, right, the best question of the day, does your compliance or your organization have a strong culture of compliance? So there's lots of different answers. We're going to see where everybody deep. falls. Yeah, it could be. What is it compliance? Could be D, <laughs> could be D. We're not going to judge. This is a safe space for fun compliance. We can't see names, so that's answers, true. It is anonymous. Free. That's right. But I will. Tell you know, you, someone's going to pick that just for fun. Now you're going to have one person. It's probably one of our staff. It's going to mess with. I understand. <laughs> Um, you know, when you look at all risk discussions and daily operations, that's very hard to do. And, you know, even banks with a robust compliance program struggle with that because there's just so many things to keep up with and so many things to go through. So, you know, the goal really, and there's not a right answer here, but it, as long as we're enhancing our compliance role and, and participating in the meetings and, and really working towards a, 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 a cohesive, my like he's going out, sorry, uh, a cohesive way of you know having that compliance culture that is really the good thing and 1.6 did for 50 so they did just nice. for funsies <laughs> hilarious i love it well and this is a topic sean and i've talked about this in the past i could geek out about compliance management systems all day long i could probably talk for a week about compliance management <laughs> and risk assessments and Sean and I had bonded over the fact that we both have a mutual love for tearing down compliance departments from scratch and rebuilding them and watching that transformation happen. It's, I think, an odd thing that not everybody enjoys doing, but we really do. And I think that you can really see how compliance risk is really intertwined in almost all of your key banking risks. You can boil down to your credit risk may have some components where you had some compliance failures. If you have an operational risk, it can always boil back down to your 
And so as, as he's mentioned, having a seat at the table and not coming across as that no department, the department of no, we really are intertwined and ingrained in every line of our operation because it is that important. And what we want to accomplish is to make sure that we're incorporating all of the best practices and the regulatory requirements that our compliance management program has all of the cylinders operating and firing at the same time. We're all rowing in the same direction. But it can be a challenge because, as we've said, compliance oftentimes is seen as that roadblock or the department of no. We want to be proactive and supportive, but sometimes we unfortunately aren't going to be popular and have to say no. So we've provided some support for you to remember those requirements, but as we head into our, our final discussion points, how have you seen organizations successfully implement this culture of compliance? I think the, the department of no is, is the perfect example. You know, here's what I want you to think about it. Instead of being the department of no, let's think about it being the department of how. How can we do this? How can we go through this? What are our options? How do we look at solutions? How do we get some of this stuff? How do we go through? Some of this stuff's going to scare you. Some of this stuff you're going to go, oh, crap, I really wish we wouldn't do it. But that's not our job. Our job is to figure out how we can do it and not to step in the way of innovation, not to step in the way of some of this stuff. And so what we have to really do, and it's hard for compliance people. Listen, I've done it for 20 years. I understand. But stepping outside the box and saying, hey, how does this affect our bank? How do we look at some of this stuff? How do we make this in the best way possible to achieve management's goal of growth or to achieve management's goal of implementing a new product and us still be okay in the risk management side? Our goal is to mitigate and look for risk and put controls in place for us to, to accomplish that. We don't want to say, hey, look, this is too risky. We don't want to do it. Now, there might be some situations where we have to do that. That's cool. But we've also got to look at a wide open area and it can't just be, hey, I don't like this. I don't like a lot of things that banks do in some aspects of it. But what we do is we put things in place to where, hey, we can manage this risk. This is what we need to do. Okay, we can look through some of this stuff. We can put controls in place on, the, on this different thing. We can put monitoring in place. Your first, second, third line is so important. When you look at the culture of compliance, it starts at your first line, whether it be a teller, whether it be a CSR, whether it be a loan officer, even a commercial loan officer, whether it be some of these people that you're dealing with, they're your first line. They start the process. They know, they know all your complaints. They know all this stuff that's going on. They, they know how your system works. They know the weaknesses of your systems. You know, they can manipulate your systems. They can go through all this stuff importance of putting resources in your first line and having that outside the box training and those discussions are so helpful. I can tell you, I've been preaching for about two years, uh, this, this onset of different training. We get all this online training and the examiners look at it and they're like, okay, whatever, you know, this is great. I guess they click through it. Look, I'm at a big company. I know how it goes now. Used to, when I had my own company, we didn't have all this virtual training I had to do. Now it's like, I want to get out as fast as I can. I got other stuff to do. That's the way they're treating your training. That's the way they're looking at it. I understand what they're going through. So let's think of things that we can do differently. What about if they have a monthly meeting? Why don't we go in there once a quarter and just say, hey, everybody, don't forget, I'm still the compliance officer. You know, we're going through some of these things. Here's some examples of stuff we found. Five minutes, 10 minutes. They don't want to hear an hour presentation. They don't want to hear some of this stuff. Go in there and just hit a reminder. Talk about some of the things that you see. Get their attention for five or 10 minutes. Hit them with something important and then let them go. You know, whether it be teller meetings, CSR meetings, whether it be management, you know, whatever it may be, put yourself in there. Get your, get your focal point in there. Show them you're part of the team when you're trying to help them succeed. That is the biggest thing. If we can keep that communication up, we can see that we're offering solutions. We can see that we're going through there. That increases the culture of compliance. I tell people all the time, I can usually walk into your bank, especially in BSA. I can walk into your institution and look at it. And within 20 minutes of me being there, I can tell you if your BSA program is working or not. How is that possible? 
if you have no lines of communication, nobody's talking to you, you're not getting referrals from the front line, you're not looking at your complaints, you're not doing all this stuff, your program's not working. You have to utilize everything that's in place, including your people and your resources to have an effective compliance management system. And if you don't have those things in place, you're behind the eight ball. If you're not looking at a, com a complaint program and making sure that you're getting all the complaints, I go into banks all the time. How many complaints you have? None. Really? Do you really have no complaints? Who better to tell you that your processes or procedures are broken or you suck better than your customers? So, don't use those as a negative. Use those as a positive. Identify things that are happening out of it. I'm looking at it. I'm working on a bank right now, CNS program. Uh, they've got over 10,000 complaints. It's a huge bank, big bank. Okay. But what we do is we look at what type of those complaints are. What's the root cause of that? If we're going to where, oh, this customer says a fee was charged incorrectly, and we're just going to make them happy and go give them their feedback, who else is affected? What's happened? Is there a breakdown in our system? Is our disclosure incorrect? What's going on with some of this stuff? We need to look at the root cause. That's why your first line is important. Your second line for monitoring is important. Your audit's important. You have to have those working in conjunction with each other. Your systems are your first thing. Make sure they're working. Your prepaid finance charges should be checked right, should be taken care of. Your disclosure should match your system, whether it be a deposit account, a loan account, whatever it may be. One of the big things the FTIC just put out is arms. We're having problems with arms right now. Why are we having problems with arms? We're getting to the adjustment period where interest rates went up. And so now we're finding out that they're not rounding correctly. They're not putting on the same day. They're, some of them aren't even marked as variable. They never changed. Some of them go over the, the maximum amount they can. And so your system processes are showing weaknesses now because rates didn't change for a long period. Now that they've changed and they're resetting, we're starting to see things in our systems that didn't get put in correctly. And that's a problem. That means that we have a weakness, whether it be on the first line in that case, or even on our monitoring platform. And so we've got to really look at it from a, a culture of compliance of being part of the solution, being part of the team and putting everything together in one umbrella and saying, this is what we do for a compliance culture. This is how we go through it. And I will tell you that uh, examiners, especially NCUA, OCC, FDIC, CFP, PET, really all of them, they look at your CMS and they say, how strong is your CMS? And if they see weaknesses within your CMS program, then it is like shark circling with blood in the water. And so we have to make sure that our compliance management system is not perfect but strong enough to show what we've been doing and how we identify things to make sure that our, our institution is doing what it's supposed to do. And that is really where the success comes from. And that's really where the basis of your examinations start. And I would just add, because complaints are another area where I get very excited because your complaint data, I think you've done such a great job of lining this out. But one of the ways to shift that compliance culture to be more proactive and more of that partnership is to look at complaints as feedback from your customers. It doesn't Absolutely. have to be a negative. And there's so much value when you look at it as feedback and doing that root cause analysis, because with each complaint that you get or that feedback that you hear from your customers, customer, you are able to increase that experience for them if you correct it at the root issue. And then oftentimes, I can give an example in a previous organization, we started going out and visiting and saying, what are you hearing from your customers? What's their frustrations? It hadn't made it to our complaint log, but they were frustrated about the way that we took pictures, the remote deposit capture. We had some mm -hmm. settings that we were able to adjust in our software, fixed it immediately, decreased the amount of work that had to be done by our back operations just by soliciting that feedback. So that's where you can show your value as part of that because a consumer complaint response is a core pillar of your compliance management program. And I know we're wrapping up, but yeah. you, you hit something right on the head, which goes into question nine. You know, when you talk about some of the balancing act and, and, and looking at it, let me give you a different point of view from a compliance perspective. You know, often we're the ones that go in there and I always say uh, every most presentations I have, and then those of y'all have seen me present before, I've got a slide that says, don't shoot the messenger. You know, I say, I don't write the rules. I just preach the good word. That's what I always tell everybody. But the thing is, 
think about the way that you interpret rules and the way that you implement rules differently. If we can balance our rules of what we want them to do with a customer service aspect of it, you may be able to get a lot more done. For example, withdrawals, denied. If there, if you have a pipeline that's just sitting out there and sitting out there, I mean, I always tell people, you, I can look at your Humdalar and see that 15 applications were denied, or excuse me, withdrawn the same day. What does that tell me? Somebody cleaned out their desk that day. I can see it, I know it. But if we say, hey, look, we're gonna set things in there to follow up and make sure that we're contacting these customers to get these potential loans, to make sure we're in constant contact. Think about that. That helps management try to grow loans. It helps your interactions with your customers and it helps us in compliance to keep those files being worked on in a timely matter and get them turned around within those, those regulatory periods. So think about that when you're presenting it. How does it not only affect us, but how does it affect the organization as a whole and what other positive spin can we put on it right. to say, hey, look, now help me help you. And that's the way we gotta look at it. Absolutely. So we did have two questions. So I'm gonna give you the option, John, if you want to address them. They're both about RESPA, section no eight. So we can either do them after and send out a list of questions or do you wanna cover them now? We got two minutes, so let's try to get it. Okay, so we've got one. We wanna focus on attaboy girl incentives for referrals for our own employees. This is not paid from loan proceeds, nor is it added to the loan. Please advise the best practice to manage and monitor. So you're gonna get into the loan, op uh, you're gonna get the loan compensation uh, rules so it would depend on what they're doing for that that quote unquote uh, amount that they're going to get you're also going to have to look at if it is uh, a pr uh, you know if it's a based on an application or approved loan there's a lot of things that you need to consider before just jumping in there so make sure you consider the whole roundabout of how it's going to work and because we don't just want to say hey we'll only approve you I'll only give you money on approved loans because there could be privacy issues there could be other things that could be going on and we need to make sure all right. Last question, because we got to get the uh, last point. All right. Question, right. So I assume it would be a violation of RESPA if a financial institution provides a specific discount on, oops, um, my thing just cut off. Sorry about that. On a specific discount on mortgage loans written that were referred to a nonprofit agency that supports LMI individuals. I, I'm, I can't say for sure one way or another. That's going to depend on certain circumstances. First of all, it depends on their settlement agent because that's what's going to be covered under the rules. So you have to look at the definition of that. You also have to look at and, and some certain factors of if it's truly a referral or if it's a program that's helping LMI individuals. So to me, that's not, a, it, there's a lot more factors that go into it to give a correct or give a better answer on that. And we promise we'll answer any of those questions that are outstanding. We will follow up afterwards. We are going to last launch our last one and we'll keep talking as we go through this. So we'll add for our questions. Our fourth polling question is, would you be interested in learning more about all of the amazing services that we have at Forvis Mazars or through ProBank Education Services that offers training and regulatory compliance programs? Let us know. We are very happy that you were able to spend this time with us. We're happy to answer any last minute questions before we, we head out. Anything that has not been answered, we will definitely make sure that that gets addressed after our presentation. And, and our contact think. information is on the first two slides. So if you need anything, let Absolutely. us know. Absolutely. We will be happy to talk compliance with you at any time. It's one of our favorite topics, hopefully you take back some really helpful information to your organization and you get to have a little bit of fun with us. Uh, we started at the beginning, Sean and I thought that this was a really fun topic. I probably should have added another polling question of, did you have fun? Because I know <laughs> we, we know had a blast. Now. Yeah, we're just gonna assume that 100% of everyone thought that this was the most fun that they've ever had in a compliance presentation. All right. all right, so we send the wrap-up video. I want to say all y'all thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for attending today. We appreciate you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you.